Yo, what's going on, y'all? It's Cone back here again today with another episode of After the Buzzer, the show where I recap the NBA games from the night. And it was just another amazing night of playoff hoops. I mean, these playoffs continue to deliver at a high level. We had Knicks Heat Game 2, which if you looked at kind of some of the injuries leading into things, you wouldn't have thought was a great game, but I promise it was. And then, of course, you had Game 1 of Lakers Warriors, which I do want to start with in this video, because if you watched my series preview video for this matchup, which I put out a couple of days ago, you'll know that this is one I'm very very excited for. Of course, there's a billion storylines that we can talk about. We've got Steph Curry versus LeBron James, both in pursuit of their fifth ring as they're getting older. You've also got just the narrative of LeBron against the Warriors. Again, he's probably sick of facing them. You've got some other star power with Klay Thompson, Andrew Wiggins, Anthony Davis, amongst others. It's just a really exciting series overall, but the basketball in particular is really what I've been looking forward to because these two teams have very different styles of play. The Warriors are a run fast and transition, just destroy you with threes type of squad, which was very much on display in this game one. While the Lakers are a bit slower, they like to get it down low to Anthony Davis or have LeBron attack the basket, get to the free throw line, and they're not a particularly great three-point shooting team. So it's a very big difference between these styles. They're contrasting teams, and I thought just watching these two teams face each other with these styles, trying to figure out which one will come out on top, is really interesting to me just from a basketball perspective. So I've been waiting for this series for a while now and game one did not disappoint. And again, if you watched my series preview video, you'll know that I mentioned some big keys to the series in that video. And one of the biggest ones to me was how Anthony Davis would play because in the first round against the Grizzlies, defensively, he was unbelievable. I mean, he averaged like, I think it was 4.3 blocks per game in that series. He was deterring everybody away from the rim. Even if he wasn't blocking your shot, you knew that Anthony Davis was down low if you were a part of the Memphis Grizzlies. And he was the biggest reason why the Grizzlies offense completely fell off a cliff. They could not score in the half court because once AD got set up down low, there was basically nothing they could do. So he was phenomenal in that series defensively, but offensively, he was a bit shaky, a bit inconsistent, and they didn't need him to be amazing offensively with the great defense that he was playing. But hanging into a much tougher matchup against the reigning champion Golden State Warriors, the Lakers needed Anthony Davis to not just be dominant defensively, but they needed him to be an incredible force offensively. And overall, they just need AD to be the best player on the court for a lot of the minutes that he played. And last night in game one, Anthony Davis was the best player on both sides of the ball. He was absolutely incredible, finishing the night with 30 points, 23 rebounds, 5 dimes, and 4 blocks, and 58% shooting. He's the first Laker since Shaq to have a 30-20 playoff game. He joins Tim Duncan as the only players to ever put up a stat line with at least 30 points, 20 boards, 5 dimes, and 3 blocks in the playoffs. Uh, he was masterful. Offensively, he did exactly what I said he needed to do in that preview video, where basically Basically, he's got the size advantage. He has to go ahead, attack down low, get his feet in the paint, and even if he shoots a jumper, have it be inside the paint. You can't settle for these really long mid-range jumpers, and he did take a couple of those. I believe only three of his field goals made were actually outside of the paint, which is perfect. Sure, you can knock down those shots, and you should attempt some of those to keep the defense honest, but you have to try and for the most part get down low. He was taking advantage of the size mismatch. He was bullying the two guys down low that guarded him, whether it was Kevon Looney or Draymond Green. He was aggressive from the get-go, which is exactly what they need him to be. He was amazing. This is exactly what you need from AD offensively if you want to win this series and ultimately try and make a finals run. You need this aggressive, attacking the paint Anthony Davis because when he does that, he's one of the most dominant players offensively in the entire league. There's really nothing you can do when AD gets down low and having this size mismatch, he's got to take full advantage of those opportunities. It seems like maybe the Lakers made that a point or Anthony Davis himself said, hey, I know what I have to do because right from the get-go, he was aggressive and he was amazing offensively, but maybe even more impressive was his defense because every single moment that Anthony Davis was out there, the Warriors were very clearly a little bit shook by his presence down low. I mean, they weren't taking as many inside shots. They took 51 threes, I think, in this game, which tied their franchise record for three-pointers attempted in a game. And part of that was because every time they went down low, Anthony Davis was there. He was blocking shots. He was altering any shots that he wasn't blocking. He was incredible. This is one of the best defensive performances that I've seen from Anthony Davis, maybe ever, maybe in the entire history of his career, especially when you take into account that it was in a road playoff game, he was dominant. And in the fourth quarter, the Warriors went on this crazy run to go from a 14-point deficit to a tie game. But after that, with about a couple minutes to go, they didn't score a single point the rest of the way because AD completely locked in. He said, okay, they're not going to score anymore. I'm going to do whatever it takes. He blocked a Steph Curry layup towards the end. He altered a number of shots. 
He was just incredible. I can't say enough amazing things about the way Anthony Davis played defensively in this game and even offensively as well. He was the best player in this game on both sides of the ball, which is what the Lakers need. And he did all of this while playing 43 minutes in this game and not resting for a single second in the second half. He played all 24 second half minutes and still looked that good over the course of that time. He was still that dominant defensively. It was amazing. It is legitimately one of the most impressive games I've seen from Anthony Davis probably in his entire career once again, factoring in the fact that it is a road playoff game. Simply put, he was amazing. This is the AD that we saw a few years ago when the Lakers won the NBA Finals, the one that ESPN after the season ranked as the second best player in the league, only behind LeBron James himself at number one. It seemed like AD was going to take the torch from LeBron as the Lakers' best player and the maybe even the league's best player and lead the Lakers forward into maybe a potential couple more rings in this era. However, because of a bunch of injuries and poor roster construction from the front office, that didn't ever come to fruition. But now, the Lakers have a chance to go ahead and make another run towards the finals. And if they want to do so, Anthony Davis is going to have to be their best player. They need both him and LeBron to be phenomenal. But especially with LeBron dealing with that foot injury that is very clearly still bothering him, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, they need AD to be better than ever, and I think he has the capability to do so. In this first game, he showed that he does have the capability to do so, and if he continues to play like this going forward, the Lakers have a real shot to make it not just out of this series, but make the NBA Finals. Again, going back to my keys to the series, another big one that I mentioned was that the Lakers needed LeBron James to be a bit better than he was in that Memphis series, because while he wasn't terrible, it wasn't the typical LeBron playoff series that we're used to. He was... He was all right, and that's not what we usually see from LeBron James. Now, a big part of that is that foot injury that continues to linger. I mean, reports are that every doctor but one told him that, hey, you probably need surgery on that and that your season should be over. But LeBron said, no, I'm going to try to play through it. And he's, you know, credit to him playing through it. But he still continues to not look like the LeBron James that we're used to. And in game one tonight, he again did not look like his usual self. He shot 9 of 24 from the field for 22 points. However, he did have 11 boards, 4 dimes, and 3 blocks. Like, he wasn't terrible. It's just, again, not a typical LeBron James dominant playoff performance. And it's clear that that foot is really bothering him. He seems a lot slower. His burst is not there like it typically is. He's not being as aggressive attacking the basket. And I think the biggest sign of this is the fact that he's settling for a lot of threes. Now, obviously, you need to shoot threes if you're LeBron. You can't just ignore them. But the volume at which he's shooting these threes and the volume at which he's making them is not great for the Lakers at this point. In this game, he went 1 of 8 from deep. And now on the playoffs as a whole, he's 9 of 49 from three, which is good for about 18.4%. It's just not a good shot right now. And I wonder if he's settling for a lot of these threes because of the foot injury. He doesn't want to attack inside as much. Like I said, his burst doesn't quite feel there. So maybe he doesn't feel comfortable attacking at his usual rate. Regardless, they need him to stop shooting as many threes. They need him to be more aggressive inside if he's able to. But I do know that that foot injury is really clearly still bothering him. And hopefully he's able to get more comfortable with it if they can get out of this series quickly and get some rest. He can be better for the next round. But for right now, LeBron just doesn't look like himself. Final quick shout outs for the Lakers. D'Angelo Russell was great in this game. He had 19 points, three rebounds, and six assists. I was impressed with how he played. Dennis Schroeder had 19 points. He was also really good. It's not usual that we see D'Lo and Schroeder both play play really well in the same game. I feel like typically one is playing well and one is really struggling. So it's nice to see the two of them can have a good game at the same time. And then I want to give a shout to Jared Vanderbilt, who was the primary defender on Steph Curry in this game. And coming into the series, I really didn't know how they were going to stop Steph Curry. I mean, the Kings got absolutely torched and the Lakers are a much better defense, but even still, they don't have a lot of great guard defenders to throw at Steph. And Jared Vanderbilt, you know, makes sense as an option. They threw him at John Morant a lot last series, but again, it's Steph Curry and it feels like Vando can do a good job, but ultimately he's probably still going to torch him. However, in this first game, Jared Vanderbilt was phenomenal. Steph did not have his best game in this matchup and ultimately I expect him to be better going forward, but at least for this first game, they did a good job. He shot 10 of 24 from the field. He had five turnovers. Now he also had six threes and 27 points. But it's Steph Curry. You're going to expect him to knock down some threes to have a good game overall. You just have to do whatever you can to prevent him from having one of those amazing games 
like he had in game seven against the Kings. So shout out to Jared Vanderbilt for the way that he played in this game. He was really, really good defensively. Also, you know, Dennis Schroeder played some solid defense as well on Steph. Probably the best defensive guard that the Lakers have. Uh, you know, they got some switches as well. So a couple of different guys had to defend Steph at different points. But overall, shout out to Vando and Schroeder, who in particular played some good defense on Steph. And the team as a whole was able to hold him from completely destroying them, which against a guy like Steph is pretty much all you can ask for. Meanwhile, for the Warriors, Klay Thompson had a good game with six threes. Jordan Poole as well knocked down six threes. This was probably one of his best games of the playoffs so far. Although the main thing that everybody's talking about is the shot that he took at the end of this game where the Warriors were down three points. Steph Curry brought the ball across half court. He got doubled. He threw it over to Draymond, who threw it over to Jordan Poole. And yeah, he had six threes. He was hot. He was having a good game. But the three that he pulled up for was like a 30-footer. Like it was a ridiculously deep three. And sure, he can knock that shot down. But you still have 10 seconds on the shot clock. I feel like you can swing the ball around one more time. You can take a dribble in. Even Draymond Green could have tried to dribble the ball in a little bit to draw some defense. And then maybe you kick back out to Jordan Poole. You try and get Steph open again, have him run off a screen. I feel like they could have just done something different. Maybe you even call a timeout in that scenario to set up a play for Steph. I just don't think a Jordan Poole 30-footer is the best option you have there. I do understand why Poole shot it in that moment, probably thinking, okay, I'm open. But even then, I just think that Jordan Poole should try and find a better look. The team as a whole has to get a better shot than that to try and tie this game up and maybe send it to overtime or even win in regulation if some crazy things happen. But yeah, just not a great shot from Jordan Poole. So that's what most people are talking about. But overall, this was probably his best games of the playoffs so far. Also, a lot of people are talking about the free throw discrepancy in this game with the Lakers shooting 20 nine shots from the charity stripe while well, the Warriors only had six and yeah that is a big difference but if you take a look at the numbers it makes a lot of sense I mean the Lakers shot just 25 threes while well, the Warriors shot 53 which once again like I said earlier in the video ties a franchise record for them they tied a franchise record for makes as well with 21 it makes sense why the Warriors didn't get nearly as many looks at the free throw line I know a lot of people are complaining but overall if you just take a look at a numbers game the Lakers whole strategy is to attack inside while the Warriors one is to kill you from outside the arc so it makes sense why there's this big difference, and I expect we're going to see more of this throughout the series. Overall, big shout to the Lakers who got this critical Game 1 win. Even if they lose Game 2, they're in a great spot, tied 1-1, going back to LA. I think the Lakers set themselves up beautifully. If they keep getting this play from Anthony Davis and LeBron James turns things around, they could absolutely pull off this upset. Moving on now, we had Game 2 of Knicks versus Heat, and I didn't get a chance to talk about Game 1 on the channel, so I'll give a quick recap. It was really fun. Jimmy Butler had another really good game, but more so, it was a team effort from a Heat squad that continues to step up in the absence of some of their other guys who are injured. They had four double-digit scores in a Game 1 win over the Knicks, stealing home court advantage. Just a big moment for this Heat team that continues to pull off upset after upset. But in some unfortunate news for the Heat, in the fourth quarter of this one, Josh Hart fell on Jimmy Butler's ankle, twisting it, and ultimately Jimmy did stay in the game. He was a warrior. He fought through the pain and played and finished out the game, but it was very clear that he wasn't 100% that he was really wincing a lot as he walked around. He was limping. He limped off the court at the end. And today, for game two, Jimmy Butler was ruled out. While meanwhile, for the Knicks, they got Julius Randle back. So they were fully healthy. The Heat continued to deal with these massive injuries. It seemed like it might be a blowout. However, if you didn't know better and just tuned into this game randomly, you probably wouldn't have known what injuries the Heat were dealing with because they were leading for most of this game. It was a back and forth battle the entire night with so many guys on this Heat roster stepping up in the absence of those other guys. Gabe Vincent had 21 points. Max Struess had 17 points. Caleb Martin had 22 points and eight boards. Bama DeBio had 15 points, eight rebounds, and six assists while playing some great defense. They were moving the ball while they were sharing. They were playing great team defense. They threw a zone at the Knicks at one point that had them completely bamboozled. It was just a great showing from a Heat team despite everything that they were dealing with. However, the Knicks continued to battle, and especially Jalen Brunson, who finished this game with 30 points. He had six threes. He had 10 of his points in the fourth quarter. They ended up winning. They ended up taking this one from the Heat late in the game, mainly due to the heroics of Jalen Brunson. Josh Hart as well was phenomenal. He had some incredible hustle plays. He had multiple big corner threes, nearly had a triple-double. RJ Barrett continues to play really well. He had 24 points and knocked out a bunch of threes. Julius Randle had one of his best games of the playoffs so far with 25 points, 12 rebounds, and 8 assists. They managed to keep things close all the way throughout the game. They battled back late, had a quick rally, and eventually the Heat just kind of ran out of firepower. The Knicks get this win to tie the series up 1-1. Big performance from the Knicks' main stars, like I mentioned, Randall, Barrett, 
Jalen Brunson, Josh Hart, their top guys really showed out in this one, but for the most part, their depth wasn't great. It was a lot weighing on the stars. They had to all have amazing performances to get this win against a really depleted Heat team. They're going to need some of those other guys to be better. One main guy in particular, Emmanuel Quickly, has not really looked like himself the entirety of these playoffs. They need him to be better. They need him to be the six minute of the year type guy that he was all season if they want to make a deep run into these playoffs. If they want to take this series against the Heat, they need some other guys to step up. But for the most part, even though it was an ugly win and they probably should not have been this close against a Heat team without Jimmy Butler, they got the W. That's really all that matters. And they managed to tie the series up before it heads to Miami. As for the Heat, they're just one of those teams that seems to always be competitive regardless of who they have on the roster. And I think a lot of this does have to do with Eric Spolstra, who's just an unbelievable coach. I made a tweet last night saying that I'm pretty sure he could take five random NBA Twitter users or even five random of you watching this video and he would probably still manage to turn out a team that makes the second round or at least is competitive every single night. I don't know how he does it. He's just such an incredible coach. The Heat's developmental staff as well with all the undrafted guys that they're playing at the moment. They're playing phenomenally well. They make these guys into incredible players. The Heat are just a really great franchise in general between coaching, between player development, guys being willing and ready to step up in the absence of some of their stars. Uh, the Heat just continue to be competitive. I was really impressed with what they did in this game. And if you told a Heat fan that Jimmy Butler was going to miss one of these games with an ankle injury and they would still be tied 1-1 going back to Miami, they'd probably be ecstatic. And those are my thoughts on these two playoff games. Let me know in the comment section below what your biggest takeaways were from these two games. I appreciate y'all watching as always. Please make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on any of these videos. I appreciate y'all watching. I'll see y'all later. Real one, say back.